So let's look at Galatians chapter 4, please. So I had a lot of fun talking about verses 1 through 5, and I'm sure you got a blessing out of that as well. So now we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 6. So as we come before the Lord in prayer, what we got to understand is that when we're speaking to God, the relationship has become father and son now, father and son. Yes, because remember, we talked about a long uh, we talked about in our last lesson concerning about the relationship of being a servant. So that's what we were before. So we were a servant before, and as a servant, we were held in captivity as well to the law. But remember, the Lord Jesus Christ died on our behalf, and he was known as the time appointed. So because of this time appointed, when a child is going to inherit something from the father, before he becomes the heir and inherits from the father, he is in a position of servanthood to the laws and the rules of his father's household. Remember that illustration I gave last time? So I'm not going to repeat it again. But the idea is, is that once you cross over this time appointed, then you get into this position of being adopted children heirs. So that's the idea. So children heirs. You finally get the inheritance. How you crossed over this time appointed, this was the crucial key where you can become this. So it was the crucial key where this man had to die in your place and take the chains off of you and put it on him. So he became a servant in your place while you became the children heir after that. So we understand that so far, right, from Paul's illustration. So now let's continue on at verse 6, following the same context right here. And because ye are sons, right, now you're his son now. God hath sent forth the spirit of his son. So God, he sent forth the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ into where? Your heart. So he is now inside you. Crying, Abba, Father. So notice right here <clears throat> that within you, you can speak out to God. And when you speak out to God right here, it is the Holy Spirit that is within you. So the Spirit of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, they're in you. And because they're in you, you can speak to God crying, Abba, Father. Now, why is it Abba? Because, now this should be an incredible blessing. Abba comes from Aramaic Hebrew. So remember, God's own chosen children during the Old Testament were the Hebrews. That was his only chosen people. He chose no other nation. But remember, the children of Israel, they kept rejecting their Messiah. So because of that, God turned toward the Gentiles. Not only that, God was now focusing on a spiritual children, not his own national or physical children by ethnicity. So now that he turned toward a spiritual children, when you became a spiritual child of God, obviously not physical like the Jews, the Lord nevertheless puts something Jewish in you spiritually. So now he considers you just like his Jewish children. So like his Jewish children back at the Old Testament who spoke to him in Hebrew, that's how close he considers you with him. Praise as God. if you are a Hebrew Jew to him. So now you can, so the spirit within you is speaking out in Hebrew, Abba, Father. So you are a Jew. That is an incredible blessing. You are part of the nation of Israel. And remember, this is all within a spiritual context, not physical. Let's keep reading here. Verse 7, wherefore thou art no more a servant. That's right. See, you're no longer this status here, a servant bound to the laws or to the law of the Old Testament, or to his rules and regulation. Let's keep reading here. Thou art no more a servant, but a what? Son. See, now you're this status. See? 
And if a son, so if you're a son, then an heir of God through Christ. See, so once you're a son, you become his heir. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something interesting. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, there are two interpretations that can be used of this concerning heir and inheritance, which is going to be very important to remember when you read the verses. There are many verses that shows that we are heirs of salvation, or if you become saved, that you inherit something from God. But there are also verses that seem to show that unless you suffer for him, unless you serve God like you should, then you, should be, then you will inherit, you'll become his heir. So what's going on right here? What's going on right here is this, is that one interpretation is this. One interpretation is that when you become a saved child of God, you automatically become an heir. But when you become an heir, see, here's the thing. We're guaranteed to go to heaven, right? That's what we possess and own. But what about all the other things that accompany heaven? For example, rewards. What about the cities that you rule? What about the inheritance of all things? What about a lot of other things that we don't know about? So here's the idea. There are verses that shows that you become an heir automatically when you get saved. But just because you become an heir of salvation, here's the thing is that what about those other verses that if you suffer, that you'll reign with him? If you serve God or suffer, you will become heirs. What does that mean? What that means is this, is because it's not, uh, there are different levels of heirs. That's the idea. Salvation is only the beginning, folks. But now we want this, as an heir, you want it to increase more and more. That's the idea. So if there are some people who try to show you that to become a saved person, to become an heir of salvation, heir of heaven, you have to suffer. You have to serve God. That's how you get saved. No, that's not the idea. The idea is this. You become an heir of God when you get saved, but that's not where it stops. The heir, uh, being an heir or ownership or the... Gaining more within the heirs, it grows when you suffer. That's the idea. That's why there are verses that show that you become an heir when you get saved and you become an heir when you suffer. That's why there are verses showing that. Why? Because when you become an heir, it's not just that. Heirs have gaining more, uh, they gain more rewards. There's a growth of heirs. That is an indisputable fact if you're an honest Bible reader. You might say, why? Because if there are people who suffer for Jesus Christ, there are people who suffer more for Jesus, and they get more rewards. There are too many verses in the Bible that shows that God rewards people by the amount that they live and suffer for Him. So it shows there there's different growth levels of heirs. There's no doubt about that. So that's one interpretation. The second interpretation is even more interesting. <clears throat> it could be that there are tif two different types of heirs. So there's one <clears throat> which is being heirs of God. So this has to relate to God the Father. And that has to do with heaven. But then there's a second one. And that has to do of Christ basically with Jesus Christ. And when you become a joint heir, so the more accurate term is being a joint heir. When you're a joint heir, then you get what Jesus Christ gets, the rulership, the rewards, inheritance, and etc. Because look at Romans chapter 8 here. Romans chapter 8. Notice that the Bible says that at verse 15, for we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Isn't that a little deja vu what Paul said at Galatians? We were servants of bondage, right? So he's repeating a similar passage at Galatians. But keep reading. But ye have received the spirit. Remember this? Spirit. So he's definitely repeating Galatians. Of adoption. Ah, remember at Galatians he mentions that we're adopted children. Let's keep reading. 
whereby we cry, what? Abba, Father. Well, that's definite that he's repeating Galatians. So this is the same passage. So within that same idea, notice what he says. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs. That's right. See, if you become a children, you become heirs. But look, heirs of God and, see, there's a second one. Joint heirs with what? Christ. But when you become a joint heir with Christ, what's the condition? If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Ah, so this makes sense then. So when there are verses that show that you get reward or you become an heir through suffering, it's talking about being the joint heir of Christ. When it talks about becoming an heir when you get saved, that has to do with being an heir of God going to heaven. So don't let these different false religions fool you that in order to become a saved uh, person and an heir of heaven, you have to suffer. You have to do good works. Don't, don't let that fool you. No, rightly dividing. That's why we're dispensationalists. There's an heir of God the Father and a joint heir of Christ. This joint heir of Christ contains suffering. The other one, heir of God, it contains being a saved person. But... Like I mentioned before, even if that interpretation is invalidated, I mentioned to you that this heir, becoming an heir, has different levels, see? Salvation is the first step. You have to do all these other steps to get all these other parts of getting an heir. That's the thing. Okay, so now let's return to our main text. Let's return to our main text. So now we understand this idea about inheritance and heirs. I hope that you got a blessing out of that doctrine. It's an important doctrine for you to understand. Amen. Okay, so Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 now. How be it then? So Paul's saying, okay, but now, however, what? When ye knew not God. So before you didn't know God, right? When you were lost. Ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. So during the time when you were lost, you didn't know God. Back then, you did service to who? Th these things that are not gods by nature. You worshiped these kind of beings that were not even gods by common sense human nature. So here's something to understand is that Paul was speaking to who? The Galatians, right? So when he was speaking to the Galatians right here, these Galatians, before they were observing God, what were they? They were observing these other beings which they assumed to be gods. But Paul pointed out right here that, no, they're not actually gods at all. Why? Because they, the Galatians, during those times when they worshipped gods, it was just a piece of rock right here. And that's no different from the scientific world today. You just find a piece of rock and then they think that that's your ancestor all from all the way back from the middle of no man's land. Take some kind of animal, Romans chapter 1. So they all worship this one rather than the creator. There's not much difference. But back then, so notice right here, they observed these things to be gods, but God says right here, no, they weren't even gods at all. Why? It's just a piece of rock. Take an uh, image of a Virgin Mary. No matter what you do with it, it's not like that something magical will poof out of that. And if you, act uh, if you actually uh, accidentally drop the image and you break it, it's not like lightning's going to fall from heaven and you die of a heart attack. Why? It's just a piece of rock. That's all that it is. It's just a piece of rock. Amen. So uh, the thing is, though, is that, but aren't there gods out there? Yes, there are gods. The Bible says that, in the book of Psalms and the book of John and other places that there are gods. There are gods out there. So then who are these? These are the sons of God, the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. Or it could also be the demoniacs right here. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, obviously, uh, angels, they do not have wings, but I'm just doing this. That way you don't get confused, all right? And I'm not an artist right here, so... But so it could be fallen angels or demons. So there are gods. But why did Paul say in that verse, by nature are no gods? Because he's pointing out this substance right here. So you got to understand this. When you're looking at Shiva, there is no such demonic creature called Shiva. It's just a name given to a rock. Does that mean, though, that there is no demonic influence behind it? No. So here's the idea. Whoever, so let's say that in... 
Hindu religion, they call this piece of rock right here Shiva. That's the name they give it. Is there demonic influence in there? Absolutely. There is some kind of God power or demonic influence in there. But you got to realize this. Originally, it's nothing but a piece of rock. The ones who are gods is not this substance. The ones who are gods is here. So this God will choose to take this dead object here, put his power in there, and then also give him some kind of name that they will worship. See, that's the idea. So when we talk about that there are gods, but that there are no gods, what we're pointing out is this. The image of the Virgin Mary is no God. It's just a dead rock. You can do whatever you want with it. But this does not invalidate the gods out there. And these gods out there can choose that dead rock, which is not a God, and put his power in there and even speak to them and put some kind of weird stuff in it. That's why there are many cases which is very strange and weird of blood tears coming off of dead statues, which is demonic and which is frightening.